Well, they get frustrated because they go. Good morning and welcome to the MAPS4 Citizens Advisory Board meeting for August 4th, 2022. Um, we will go ahead and call our meeting to order. Um, item two on our agenda is the approval of minutes from the July 7th, 2022 MAPS4 Citizens Advisory Board meeting. They were included in your packet. Hope you've had the opportunity to take a look at them. So if there's no changes or amendments, I take a motion in a second. Please cast your vote. Passed. Thank you so much. So moving on to um, item three, items for individual consideration. A, receive the MAPS for monthly financial report ending June 30, 2022. Mr. Todd. Thank you, Madam Chair. You have in your packet the MAPS for monthly financial report for the period ending uh, June 30th, 2022. Uh, briefly here on the revenue side for the month, $11,501,069. Fiscal year of $133,755,305 and total of two, oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading off the wrong, I'm, I didn't include the interest, but here I'll go down to the bottom of total revenue, $260,998,124, <clears throat> including the interest. On the expenditure side for the month, $5,127,233. Fiscal year of $99,012,054 and total of $100,042,054. If you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Any questions on the financial report? If there's none, I take a motion and a second. <coughs> Please vote to receive the report. Okay, motion passes. Thank you. Moving on to item B recommend approval of the final plans and specifications to be advertised for bids, project number, MAPS for Fairgrounds Coliseum. So you've seen updates as we've gone along, and remember that this one is further ahead than all the other projects because the, the design was funded through MAPS 3. But we're glad to be bringing you final plans today. Travis Pauley from Populous is here to go through uh, the design and what's in the plans. Morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, excited to be here to present final plans to you all. Um, you've seen this before, so a lot of it will look familiar to you, but we've thrown in some new stuff uh, to show what we've been working on since we last presented it to you. Um, but mostly we've been finalizing the plans, getting into all the details and everything, but we'll walk through those plans as well as some other images here this morning for you. Um, as you all know, we're out here at the fairgrounds, um, right along 44 and I-40. Uh, main entrance right there at our orange arrow off of May on Gordon Cooper Boulevard. And as we zoom in, we know we're replacing the Newark Arena built in 65. It served us for a, a good long while here, um, full all year round, over 250 event days a year. Um, so really good use out of that arena. Um, biggest economic impact in the, in the city out here at the fairgrounds. So the new Coliseum is going to be going right there up against the, the existing Coliseum with the intent of keeping the Newark operational throughout the construction of the new Coliseum. Um, you can see our two utility restrictions that are running right there parallel with the, the Coliseum that kind of gave it its shape and determined how far out from the Coliseum that we could pull it. Um, so that's, that's what determined where the location of the Coliseum is. And you can see we overlap the existing Newark just a little bit due to that um, restriction there. The other thing I'll point out on this slide is the expanded parking that's going south of the railroad, um, right by the Coliseum, that will replace the parking that we're overtaking with the new building. So this will be done in phases. As I said, it's uh, overlapping that north, so we've got to phase this out. Um, the first phase is there on your bottom right. We'll take off the entry portion of the, the north um, so that we can build that, that new Coliseum where it overlaps a little bit. Second phase on the upper right, building the new Coliseum. Third phase on the lower left, 
where we demo the NORIC. I'll point out the temporary construction there in blue, the temporary construction path there in blue. Um, that's how competitors will get from the super barn to the new Coliseum during demolition. And then on the upper left is the final phase to finish out of the site and that show office element that's there connected to the super barn. Um, so the site plan, when all is said and done, will look like this. Um, we've got our nice plaza space to the north that'll connect to the um, fairgrounds and eventually extend all the way over to the super barn there. Um, you can see how we'll be coming in on Gordon Cooper Boulevard right into that um, main entry facade that you saw on the first slide. So that'll be a really nice welcoming entry as you come in off Gordon Cooper Boulevard. Um, and then on the south side there, we've got our loading dock, our chiller yard, and some of our other utility features. Um, and then I'll point out the future temporary connector that we know is a, a critical element to the fairgrounds operation, not part of this project, but the intent is for that to come on board as soon as possible afterwards. So our floor plan looks pretty familiar probably from the last time you saw it. Not a lot of changes here. Um, we've got our two main entries, one there on the right side, one on your upper left. So as I'm coming in on the right main entry, we've got our retail space above it and our um, ticket office there below it in green. Um, coming up on around the top, we've got our locker rooms in orange there, six locker rooms, our big main kitchen, and then our north lobby in the upper left-hand side. So that's the lobby that competitors coming from the super barn or the fair area will come into. Um, escalator at both lobbies, as well as public elevator at both lobbies. We've got our big back of house areas on the west and east ends for setting up all the pinning and different events that goes on in there with the animals and the horses. Um, nice big 270 foot by 140 foot arena floor. And then our big return alley that comes back around from the back of house east to the back of house west. Key element to this arena and one of the things that distinguishes it among other arenas. Um, we've got our loading dock, uh, maintenance shop, green room, and other items there on the south side that you see as well. So up on the concourse level, this is our main public level. So you'll come up to this level, for most people up through that grand stair or the escalators or elevator there on the right side. For people coming from the fair side, it'd be on the escalator or stairs there on the left side. Um, nice big open concourse, about 18 feet all the way around. Uh, even more open there on the right side around the main lobby where our, we've got our bar and areas for vendors and exhibitors to set up. Um, the one good thing about this layout that I'll point out compared to a lot of arenas you go in is you're not going through vomitories and things like that to go to your concessions and restrooms. You're going right up onto the concourse. So no matter what you're doing, you're going to be able to see into that bowl, see the scoreboard and see what's going on in the arena. Um, I'll point out our, our concessions and other amenities in purple on this slide here because we'll talk about those a little bit later on in the presentation. We've got our main atrium bar there on the right, and then we've got the four concessions kind of in each quadrant of the building. You can see them in purple. And then our lounge space is there on the uh, left side of the building with our loge seating off of that. Um, other than that, we've got our suites there in the lower right and some other um, restrooms and utility spaces as well as a production suite. Up above all that, we've got our catwalk, about 51 feet off the ground. We've got six spotlight, uh, recessed spotlight platforms that come off that catwalk to give really good coverage in there. We've got our rigging beams that are spread across the arena floor, so it gives them uh, maximum flexibility to host whatever kind of events, stages, and uh, other things they want in this facility. Um, roof plan is pretty straightforward. Uh, sloped roof going to those two roof wells where we've housed all that mechanical equipment we've talked about before. That gave us a lot of our efficiency, being able to house that up in those wells hide it away, and shoot it straight into the Coliseum. So as we slice this thing in half, this is kind of what you'd be looking at. Um, we can see our rigging beams, our rigging grid up there at the top with our scoreboard and our, those recessed spotlight platforms, um, those mechanical roof wells on either side, and the concourse, and of course our bowl, and um, those spaces down below the bowl, mechanical back of house um, and return alley spaces. Our seats are elevated about six feet above the arena floor. Um, that's for the livestock and equine um, shows and events that go on there. That's the best setup for them. And then when basketball or a concert comes in, we'll bring in portables that will go all the way down to the floor that will line up with those seats that you see there. So zooming on in there, uh, just a little bit closer view to help you understand it. Catwalk shown in yellow, our main concourse level there in that blue. Um, lower level in red with mechanical and return alley. You can see our judges platform that we've integrated into the bowl there on the right side. So for all the equine and livestock events, that's where the judges can sit. That will be infilled when we want a full bowl experience. And then you can see the mechanical equipment there coming in straight in from the roof well up over the catwalk. 
So as we look at a few different layouts that we have in here, we can flex from about 4,700 seats to up to about 7,500 seats, depending on the layout. This will be kind of the base layout for our equine and livestock events. Um, nice big 21 inch wide seats, padded seats throughout the bowl. So that'll be a, a really elevated experience from what people are used to out there at the NORC and, and frankly in most arenas of this size. Um, so the experience will be really enhanced with, with those kind of amenities. Um, as we expand it out for our rodeo or bull riding type of layout, we can get up to about 7,000 seats. You can see those portable bleachers that come all the way from that arena wall down to the arena floor level, as well as some folding chairs on the floor. Um, an end stage concert, we can get up to about 7,300 seats, similarly with the portables and the floor seats. And then with the basketball layout, we're at about 7,500 seats. And that's all with the 21-inch uh, the seats um, throughout. So as we go to the exterior, you've seen this. It's a little bit updated with uh, panel sides and things, but it should look about the same as what you're used to seeing. We've got the nice panel layout going around the, the facade, kind of giving it that distinct, um, unique character. It continues around the um, highway sides, I'd say, the, the south and west sides of it. We've integrated that big OKC on the left side that you see that we'll hopefully can see from the highway to give it a nice big element, um, defining element from a distance. And then our nice big open plaza space to host a variety of events, uh, whatever they want to use that plaza space for. As we step inside, this is our main lobby area. Big open space, you can see up into the concourse, see out those windows up at the top of the stair. Um, we've got that really neat OKC signage as you walk in to give it that, that defining feature, that kind of photograph moment of, of you've made it to OKC. Um, we've also integrated some graphic signage there below that for different events. That could be static to start with or digital signage. We've, we've um, prepared for either one of those. Um, and then I'll walk through after this a little bit of the palette that we've shown throughout the rest of the, the facility as far as the interior materials are concerned. So we'll look at the, the um, lobby and concourse materials and then I'll go into some of the other features that are around the concourse. So as we look at the lobby, we've, we've kind of created a nice uh, neutral cream uh, background palette with the wall and the tile, and that's intentional because of the dirt and the dust that is so prevalent in this facility. We didn't want to do bright white that's going to show that stuff all the time and be extremely hard to keep clean. So just a little bit of off-white and cream color will, will help us a lot in that aspect. And then our accents really come from those um, wood and charcoal colors that you saw on that last slide. So that's in the lobby and around the concourse level. And then around that concourse where I pointed out those purple um, bar and concession features is where we've tried to pop in some color and different materials and give some excitement to the concourse. So this is that atrium bar that you saw on the right side of the plan with the really neat copper tiles and the bold black and white tiles in the background. Um, the other side, we've got our lounge. We integrated these brass portals to really help it stand out. Brought in that neat blue bar front tile there to tie into the blue band that goes around the arena floor. That's a really defining feature of the fairgrounds arena. It's in all the pictures. So that's one of their defining things. So we're trying to bring that into a few other elements like this lounge bar. Um, on the outside of that bar, on the concourse side, we've got a, a nice textured tile that'll go around the wainscot around that side and those brass portals that kind of define the entry elements and the bar elements around the outside. Um, our suites, similar palette, you'll see it's tied all throughout um, with the wood and the charcoal colors, but a little bit of an upscaled look with that wood wall and the charcoal tile on the backsplash. And then around the concourse level, we've got our four concessions, and this is an area where we, we saw we could bring in some, some pops of color and some life and some personality. Um, and it was, the challenge was trying to figure out how to do that and how to do some naming and give it some unique look without giving it um, any tie to a sponsor or any tie to a specific food type and leaving it open enough that they can do whatever they want in there. Um, so we decided to go with different colors and then basically use the directions of where those concessions are located to really kind of use it as a wayfinding element as well. And then we drew inspiration from the, the really neat retro and vintage signs that we see all around Automobile Alley and Stockyard City and all the areas of Oklahoma City. So that's what you see there. We can bring, if a sponsor comes on board, you know, we could still utilize this and it could be the so-and-so East Grill or anything like that. But um, we really, we think this could give the, will give the, um, the concourse a really fun personality and, and a way to easily get around and find your way in the, in the uh, Coliseum. And then just looking at some of our signage, this is just a, a, a handful of a few of the signage that we have around. Once again, we, we're designing signage, interiors, everything, so all of it's integrated together. You can see the, that palette um, coming in throughout the signage here. 
We've got some of our basic wayfinding signage there on the left with the row and section IDs, as well as in the middle on your right side. That's the kind of signage that you'll see around the concourse directing you. Um, those charcoal colors with the wood accents and then that nice cream element for our font. Um, we think it gives it a really a nice modern but also timeless feel that, that fits in with the, the by, feel of the Coliseum. Um, and then we've got some feature elements like our Gateway of Champions signs and our pylon signs there on the upper right. So where we... So where are we all at? Um, construction budget right now, we're at about 102 million. That's coming from MAPS 3, MAPS 4, hotel tax uh, through the fairgrounds. That includes FF&E, as well as that 23 million of other funding. Um, our latest construction estimate puts us right there at that $102 million number. We're carrying two alternates currently, um, one for food service equipment, and that will be food service equipment that we can do at a later point, all the food service that's essential for them to operate on day one is in the base bid, as well as some of the graphics and signage, and once again, same concept. The essential elements for wayfinding and graphics are in the base bid. This is kind of the more decorative signage um, that would be additional. As far as the schedule goes, we're right here in the middle of it, about to hopefully approve final plans and specs in July, right on schedule. Um, go to bidding right after this, and construction hopefully can start right after the fair in September. Um, the goal right now is to get that completed in April 24, so we can have it ready for that fair in 2024. And that's what I've got for you today. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Great presentation. Lots of work has gone into this. Thank you. Thank you yep, very much. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. That's the question, isn't it? So that is something that uh, the finance director and I are working on. It's not uh, exactly determined right now, but we're working on identifying that. But by law and by city policy, we wouldn't put that out to bid until those funds are identified. Okay. And we're about 4% over collection, so would that approximately cover that at this point? Um, I can't do the math that quick in my head. Okay. And then the original bid for the arena was about $23 million less than what it is currently. <clears throat> the original bid was about $80 million, Or the original projected cost. Estimate, yeah. Yes. Well, okay. it's, it's varied. You know, there's been a lot of, a lot of cuts and, and a lot of VE. The, typically, with a MAPS project, we would scale everything down to be within a given budget, but with an arena, you can't do three-fourths of a standard arena. Um, we've, we've value engineered this as far as, as we think is possible without really hampering the, the operations of the facility, so that's why we're trying to find additional funds so that we can fund this. Very good. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Bob. Teresa, let me just comment uh, that uh, the MAPS 3, of course, uh, in the fairground subcommittee was uh, overseeing the design aspect of this before it comes now to MAPS 4 for the construction side. Um, I would echo what David said. This has been value engineered to the point of uh, uh, you know, populace has spent countless hours in working uh, very closely with the uh, State Fair Board, State Fair staff, trying to design this in a way that uh, would be uh, greatest utility uh, for the fair, try to meet within the budget, but as the process worked on, uh, it became impossible to meet that original budget amount. Uh, the uh, fairground the subcommittee for MAPS 3, the MAPS 3 board, with full knowledge of this 23 million that's out there that we need to raise, uh, unanimously approved uh, the final plans. Um, and uh, Ron Norick, who's the chair of the fair board, Tim O'Toole, who's just retired as the CEO of the state fair, uh, have attended those meetings and heartily endorsed uh, this design. They feel that this design is just fabulous. It meets all of their needs, and they're very excited about this. Obviously, I guess nervous about the ability of the city to, to raise those additional funds, but confident that that will happen. Uh, so uh, 
the MAPS-3 component of this all unanimously uh, approved these final plans uh, and specifications, sending it on to us now to give sort of our oversight, although we're more on the construction side and we'll oversee that rather than the, than the design. But I would encourage us to approve the plans and specifications with the understanding that it won't go to city council until David works his magic and comes up with those additional funds. Uh, and I think the city has a number of tools in its toolbox to, uh, uh, to get those funds and exactly where they'll come from uh, remains to be decided. But uh, I think city staff, city manager, city council can work some magic and, uh, and, and come up with those funds. And hopefully we can stick to the timeline that uh, we're talking about or maybe not more than a month uh, uh, or two pushing it back from where we are. So. Anyway, I just wanted to share the, uh, especially the fact that the state fair officials, state fair board, uh, MAPS 3 uh, committees and board were all heartily in favor uh, of this. And so it comes to us in that context. Thank you, Bob. Kevin, did you have another comment? No. Any other comments? I have a question. What happens if, uh, um, <coughs> well, I have to Bob's point and to Director Todd's point, uh, well, I have faith that you all could come up with um, uh, what you call it, magic uh, to help us figure out what these funds will look like. Let's, I, I like to swim in uh, anxiety sometimes. So let's just say hypothetically that comes to council, council doesn't approve that. I'm not saying that's what's gonna happen. I'm just, just asking. Uh, how much does that affect the design? You see what I mean? Like if this, if this body approves this design and then there's not 22 or 23 million dollars worth of funding available for said design does that send them back into redesign i just want to make sure i understand uh, what well it, it could but like i said I, I feel like we value engineered this as much as we can yeah. and and the dimensions of the building are somewhat determined just because it's an arena um, you know, I, I, I know that we will work really hard to, to find those funds, and, and I think council will think hard also because this is such an economic driver. There, there's a tremendous amount of, of economic impact through this facility uh, with all the, the people that visit, with all the horse shows. So it, it, it is a, a very important project. Yeah, I th oh, go ahead, Bob, please. James, I, I, might, I, I don't know. I'd have to... Uh, look to, to David for, for guidance. My suspicion is if council disapproved the, the, the plans, it would probably go back to MAPS 3 uh, because that was where the design work was done. Mm -hmm. And it would fall back to them. We, Fairgrounds subcommittee thought we had our last meeting. I remember you saying that. A week, couple of weeks ago, maybe not, uh, depending on what happens. But because the design aspect was in MAPS 3, it would probably go back to, to that group first before coming back here if we couldn't come up with the funds and had to redesign the, the arena. Hopefully that won't happen. Well, and I think to Director Todd's it's my thing, uh, comments, I think it's going to be very important to communicate with council what you described in terms of the value engineering and where we are yeah. so that they know how important um, it like is to avoid that. There's not much more cuts that can happen. Right, right. Right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay. If not, I would take a motion in a second for approval of the recommended final plans. Please cast your vote. Monique, did you vote? Okay, the motion passes, thank you. I guess your computer's a little sleepy this morning. We good? Okay. 
All right, thank you. Okay, moving on to item 3C, <coughs> recommend approval of engineering services contract with Kimley Horn and Associates um, for the MAPS 4 Park programming for neighborhoods and community park master plan development for a fee of $496,200. So this is an engineering contract, and I think that everybody's familiar now with the process that we go through for selecting architects. Um, this is for the master plan. Remember that on the parks we were given a sum of money and a description that it would, uh, would affect all, I think there's 104 neighborhood parks. We need a plan. We need to know um, the, the things that each of those need, they're, they're not all the same. So this is to develop that master plan to develop budgets and priorities on, um, on the parks. So we're very anxious to get started on this. Okay. And I would ask um, Jessica and Monique, do you all have any, any comments from the subcommittee presentation? Push the wrong button. No, um, I've seen this presentation now twice. Um, <laughs> for those of us who serve on the selection committee um, from a subcommittee, and so I think we're trying to be very thoughtful in our approach as to how we gather feedback from the community um, as to what they would like to see in their neighborhood neighborhood parks, but also um, being mindful of the demographics surrounding each park and the way we are asking for not only. Um, wanting needs but critical issues that need to bring their parks either up to code for ADA compliance. Um, so I think the group is trying to be very mindful of that. Monique, do you have anything to add? Um, I will say I think the group is being um, very mindful about um, managing expectations for this project. While it seems like this particular project um, does have a lot of funding, we're talking about over 100 parks that need updates and changes. And so, um, you know, I believe some of the conversation was like, you know, some people want pools at their park. Well, this is not that. Yeah, right. <laughs> like this is not, we don't have money for that. And so I, um, I believe that <clears throat> Kenley Horn um, knows that they need to manage expectations um, as far as the community on that part. Right, thank you. Any other questions or comments? I have questions. Yes. Is this, uh, how many contracts do we have with Kimley Horn? Uh, three maps for. Uh, I believe this is about the third, but they're all different groups within Kimley Horn, so it's not the same people working on it. So we have engineers working on bus stops, and Darren is landscape architect that'll be working on the parks. Okay. Is there like a a Excel sheet or a document that we have access to to kind of know like what consultants are working on what projects. Just I can. I, we have an internal document that okay. we keep track of that, and I can share that with you. It'd be nice just to look at it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Any other questions or comments? When a couple things, just building on what Monique just said, the. Um, I think it might be helpful when we're out there, and I'm guessing the cons I haven't seen the presentation, um, so I'm a little jealous of two times. Uh, <laughs> no, no, don't be? Okay, fair enough, fair enough, I'll trust you. Um, but I would imagine the language we use will be helpful, needs versus want, is that, that already kind of good? Because I think when we put that expectation there, that frames it in some helpful ways might want to pull, but you need bathrooms. <laughs> right, and that's the, one of the things that we were talking about, establishing parameters when we're going out to do these um, open, they're calling them open houses, where mm. um, we're gathering community feedback, but understanding, you know, to your point, do we have restrooms, you know, is there, is, can you walk around the park, are the sidewalks, can, you know, can you push a stroller around for a family, those are all things that I think they're very mindful of. And then my only other follow-up. With the budget I, that we have. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, and I really appreciate you all being there to have those conversations. And speaking of conversations in these open houses, and I've already spoken to Director Todd about it, but I would imagine it would be probably pretty helpful, should your time permit, for the members of this advisory board um, and the respective parks commissioners for each ward to as much as possible to participate in that outreach. And I think that would be uh, such a wonderful opportunity um, 
So I don't know if that's already part of the plan. Uh, and I know I'm asking maybe a bit more of your time, but I just think that might be a very helpful. There's a tremendous amount of, of input and we'll make sure that's on the list. You're welcome, uh, everybody. That's, <laughs> well, that's, that's really the goal that we emphasize with them is, is that, the, as, as Jessica said, the people in the general area get to have input on their park. Yeah. And you all are such leaders in your community. I think they'll, and you're trusted. Right, Jessica's trusted, Daisy's trusted, Monique, they know you, and I think when they see you all alongside <clears throat> the consultant, that trust building will be very important, so thank you. Okay. Nice comments. Anything else? All righty. Um, if no other questions or comments, I take a motion in a second, please. Okay, please cast your vote. The motion passes, thank you. Moving on to item 3D, recommend approval of engineering services contract with CEC Corporation for the MAPS for CB Cameron Parks Improvement and South Lake Parks Improvement. So this item is for engineering, for actually doing the plans, but there's a little bit of planning at, at the beginning to, to analyze between the two uh, soccer facilities. So. Um, it comes with the recommendation from the subcommittee also. We're ready to get started on this. Yep. Any comments or thoughts? Jessica? Um, again, seen the presentation twice now. <laughs> so um, they, again, being mindful of what's happening at South Lakes, what's happening at Cameron, and trying to gather feedback from the different entities. There's already master plans for both of these parks, and so they will be following the master plans that are already established. Right. Anything else? Again, I have 100% faith in this particular um, engineering group with this contract. Um, they've been very amenable to um, any and all of the suggestions that the subcommittee wanted to offer. Um, and so I feel comfortable in approving this. Great. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Seeing none, we'll take a motion in a second. <clears throat> Please cast your vote. Moving on to item 3E, recommend approval of binding term sheet for the lease and management agreement between the City of Oklahoma City, the Oklahoma City Pub P Property Authority, and the Oklahoma County Diversion Hub. So continuing on with <laughs> identifying and affirming operators for the various uh, projects that we have, this again is a binding term sheet that um, I believe I explained last month. I, I won't go into all detail. I think everybody here understands what that is. We have a short uh, presentation. Megan Taylor from the Diversion Hub is here to talk to you about the Diversion Hub. Great. Welcome, Megan. Hello. Thank you so much uh, for having me. My name is Megan Taylor. I am the Executive Director at the Diversion Hub here in Oklahoma City. Um, I know a few of you have heard several presentations about what we do at Diversion Hub, and so, um, but I also know that a few of you may not be so familiar with what we do. Um, and so I am going to just give a brief overview of what we do at Diversion Hub and then move on to what I was asked to present about, which is a high level uh, understanding of what we're gonna do with the new location. So, Okay, so the Diversion Hub in Oklahoma City has been operating for several years. We started in the Public Defender's Office, truly starting to just learn about what the needs were in the community, specifically the justice-involved folks. Um, what we do is we connect individuals um, that are wrapped in the criminal legal system with the needed resources to ultimately help them um, remain out in the community and be safe, um, self-sufficient, and stable members. Uh, we do this through housing the essential experts that are already doing the great work in the community under one roof by increasing the collaboration and access to those services. When we house these essential experts that are in the community doing the work um, under one roof, we are removing those inherent barriers with having to travel from agency to agency um, to get those needed resources and services. 
Um, and so we see an increase in engagement with our clients and success ultimately with getting them out of the criminal legal system here in Oklahoma County. Um, with this new location, um, our hope is to increase those essential community partners by bringing them under one roof. So we are constantly learning from the people we serve that has been paramount to everything we do. We don't pretend to know what the citizens in Oklahoma City need. We actually make sure that we listen to them, give them a voice, as well as the key stakeholders that are working within the criminal legal system. So with this new location, we hope to take our 10 on-site partners that we have and increase that um, to improve what services our clients are getting. Some other examples and, and conversations that we've had about what we will do with this location, um, there are constant um, desires by the court system to streamline services, be more efficient, but there is a capacity um, for them. And so we're constantly trying to make sure that we can meet those needs and fill those gaps by having enough space for them. Um, the Diversion Hub does provide the expertise in the community with navigating the criminal legal system. And so if we're able to pair that expertise of justice navigation and case management to all of the work that the agency partners are already doing, we know we will continue to make a positive impact with reducing the jail population, with increasing access to services, and keeping people safe in the community. Um, we have one of our major partners that we work with are the treatment courts. So we work closely with drug court, closely with uh, mental health court, um, with vet court, and we want to be able to meet those needs constantly. And so there have been conversations about having a space allocated and dedicated to the treatment court team at the Diversion Hub location so that we have those inherent barriers of accessing the courthouse removed as well as all of the community partners on that same location to be able to meet the needs of the clients. Um, more rehabilitative and restorative classes. We want to help the court system be more innovative and provide classes that are actually going to help people. And so being able to house those at Diversion Hub is essential. We do peer support at Diversion Hub, life skills, um, art classes, as well as all of our other programs, but we're limited to space. And so we want to be able to bring those partners on site and do more of those classes so that we can increase the compliance so that folks are staying out in the community and not um, back in Oklahoma County Jail just because they could not attend the classes they needed to. Um, more staff. This is really hard work. It's really important work. Um, we're working with a vulnerable population and we're also working with the court system. And so we need to be able to provide quality services. We're working with human beings. We care about being trauma-informed. We care about being data-driven. Um, but we also have to make sure we have enough staff to, staff to actually deliver those services. So being able to have space um, at this point, we don't have the space to increase our staff. Um, and so with this new location, we'll be able to increase the staff, which of course increases the amount of people that we serve. Ultimately, um, this building is gonna help us increase our impact. This is gonna allow us to use the data, use what we're learning from the people in the community to increase our work. Um, so we are very happy and honored to be here. If there's any other questions, there's a flow chart up there. Um, this is not a very simple model, so a flow chart kind of is a little bit easier to refer to. Um, so just to kind of give you a little bit, you'll see you know, the who, who we serve, and then you'll also see the partners that we have on site. Um, so again, we hope that that list of actually nine on-site partners, we have one new one not on there, uh, will increase because we have a lot of amazing agencies in the community and we want to harness their expertise and, and really partner with them to improve this population. Thank you for your presentation. Um, any questions, Bob? Are there other <coughs> My mic off. Are there other partner agencies that in a perfect world you would love to have on site that could be joined? Uh, 
uh, with, with the new building? Yes, sir. So there are a lot of partner agencies that we work with that aren't listed as an on-site partner just because maybe we don't have the capacity. Um, we work closely with Community Health. They're a huge partner of ours. They're very essential in this community. We work closely with Upward Transitions. We work closely um, with other programs with Work Ready, so through public strategies. Um, we could probably double this pretty easily um, because we're individualizing all of the needs. So anything a client comes in with needs, whatever those are, we're going out in the community and figuring those out. So, um, so yes. And, and absolutely. would the plan be to, to bring those partners on site, if at all possible, uh, in the future? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Can you speak on the diversity of your staff as of now? Yeah, so diversity is essential. It's important to be able to reflect the population we serve, also just have diversity in how we work within this complicated um, world, right? We work in the criminal legal system. There are a lot of inherent inequities and inefficiencies. Um, and so constantly trying to address that and trying to make sure that we're giving equal opportunity. Um, so yes, that's very important for us. And does that reflect your staff now? It does reflect our staff now. Um, I don't have the exact breakdown mm -hmm. on, on race, um, but we are cognizant and constantly trying to make sure we address that because that is essential for us. Harry and Shay, did y'all have any comments from the subcommittee? Okay. Okay. Great. Harry, did you have any other comments? No. no. Except, none except that we are very impressed with the work of the Diversion Hub and uh, see the the boundaries, the restrictions of the facilities they're in now, and we're excited about offering this for our community and the people that are served. It is a it is an important continuing ingredient in a criminal justice reform in our community, and we're excited to be a part of it. Great. Thank you. Um, so we did have a citizen sign up to speak on this item, um, Mr. Washington. Megan, if you want to, yeah, you can. If you want to have a seat, oh, okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Washington, just as a reminder, you have three minutes. Thank you. Greetings, greetings, this wonderful committee here. I hadn't heard much about this diversion hub. Uh, actually, I have had, but I haven't had any real opportunity to deal with them. But it sounds like to me they're doing some favorable things that I intend and love being a part of. There's only one thing I don't see my organizations up there anywhere. <clears throat> to not recognize me of all, I think all of you know, even with your television and media things and all this nature, what Michael Washington stands for. He stands for freedom, justice, and equality of everyone. Bottom line, and he would himself not allow anybody to disrespect or disown him. Not saying she's doing it, now don't get me wrong. Just saying. Now then, I think this is a very unique thing this lady just spoke about. And I'd like myself to become more and more familiar with it. I'd like to also be considered a partner, watch it now, because the things that I do in community and society, I speak for the young people. I keep, as we everybody know, I'm trying to get that jail down. So again, Michael Washington already has the spot ups, and he needs to be recognized for the great contribution that he makes to society as a whole, and not just his community. Now then. So yes, I'll be definitely speaking with this lady and her group a little bit more. And guess what? We expect to bring a little bit of iced tea on a hot summer day to it. We definitely want to give it what it needs. Because when I watch this here, nobody has to so-called be liked which Michael Washington already knows he's not liked because the things he does, what you who would be. I love it. But at the same time, no one can say that I've disregarded, disregarded and dis disrespected or disregarded anybody else, no matter what you stand for. Right? Good. I'm going to finish down there. Right. You know, I'm a fast speaker. I like to continue. Now, having said it in my conclusion, Oklahoma Coalition Against People Abuse, where our motto is change your world and your world, watch it now, this obviously is what this lady is doing, changing people's worlds so they don't have to con continue committing acts of recidivism, homelessness, or whatever the case may be. Watch it then. So why not have a guy like even not liked to come in sharply dressed, be bold, and tell everybody what he sees every day in society and community? 
Why not let him be able to come in and know he has great influence with a lot of people? Instagram, Facebook, go and look at it. As a matter of fact, in closing, my intent is to work with this group and many others, but it must be recognized that You have 30 things, seconds. 30 seconds? Oh, you said 45 seconds? 30 seconds. 99 seconds. Oh, no. <laughs> no, I'm just having fun now, really. But yes, I'm very serious about what I said. I like to be jovial. I like to have fun. I like to be sincere. In closing, I will be back. Arnold Schwarzenegger said that. Have a great day. Michael Washington, uh, before you come back, um, something you mentioned these followers you have. That's wonderful. And of course, as a council person, I've seen you up here many times. And I appreciate your civic engagement. I have good news for you and anybody at home who wants to share this with their followers. Just do a quick Google search, Diversion Hub, okay. OKC, and all the information that Megan just shared, share this. And yep. your work specifically as an advocate for getting folk out of that cycle of crime, out of that cycle of recidivism. Share this, I share this. Read through this, and if you have questions, come back. But share this. I will. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. If not, I would take a motion and a second to approve the fine sheet. Please cast your votes. <coughs> The motion passes, thank you. So moving on to item 3F, recommend approval of binding sheet for the lease and management agreement between the City of Oklahoma City, the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority and Metro Technology Centers um, for the MAPS 4 Henrietta B. Foster Center <coughs> operating partner. Same binding term sheet, however, this, um, this project went through an actual RFP process and were interviewed and the selection committee has recommended uh, Metro Technology Centers. Jeremy Cowley is here with a cast of many uh, <laughs> to, uh, to give you some information on what they plan to do. Uh, good morning, my name is Jeremy Cowley, Senior Director of uh, Student Affairs and Workforce Development for Metro Technology Centers. Pleasure to be with you this morning and um, share some information with you, but would like to introduce uh, to you our uh, consortium of partners that are gonna help us accomplish um, this mission. We have a, a brief presentation um, to give to you today and uh, walk you through our thoughts and process in regards to the Henrietta B. Foster Center. Good morning, I'm Kimberly Francisco, Executive Director, Progress OKC. Hello everyone, I'm Daisy Munoz, Capital Access Manager for Progress OKC. Good morning, Melva Franklin, Program Director, Progress OKC. Hi, Matthew Guillory, um, Director of Strategic Development for the Small Business Development Centers. Good morning, Quentin Hughes, Board President, Northeast OKC Renaissance, Inc. Um, we are happy to be able to uh, share with you today our vision um, for the Henrietta B. Foster Center for uh, Minority Enterprise Development. Um, as many of us in the room know, uh, the city of Oklahoma City has really experienced a, a meteoric rise over the last 30 years, uh, really by pulling itself up. Um, by its bootstraps, utilizing uh, maps uh, to do so. Uh, we've seen the resurgence of downtown. We've seen adjacent uh, districts really be able to um, reinvest in themselves and be revived. And we've also seen um, historic corridors uh, come back to life. Uh, but throughout that same time, not all of that uh, success has necessarily <coughs> made it uh, to communities of color, uh, like uh, the ones that uh, the various uh, of us in the room represent. And so uh, this consortium has really come together to respond uh, to the opportunity uh, uh, for the operations of the uh, Henrietta B. Foster Center in order for it to be a transformative model uh, that can be looked at in the city 
uh, but as, as well as nationally for impacting the economic ecosystem and opportunities for uh, minority enterprises. So this, our consortium um, is a collaborative um, for minority enterprise development uh, with, over, with almost 100 years of experience um, uh, supporting small businesses in the Oklahoma City community. And so our, our real goal is achieving parity um, when you look at the distribution of population versus distribution of uh, enterprise uh, leadership in the city, we want to see those at the least match. Um, and we're going to leverage our ability to collaborate, uh, innovate, um, and execute in order to achieve that. Where the Foster Center sits currently at Northeast 4th and Durland, um, is right in the heart of Northeast Oklahoma City. Um, the area we know, um, Oklahoma City, as segregation began wholeheartedly, redlining in the 1900s, um, we saw the emergence in our community of servicing our own. And so you saw the rise of Northeast 4th Street, Northeast 2nd, as well as 7th as business corridors. In essence, we weren't able to attend um, pros prosper, eat at other restaurants, have services, dentists, doctors, so we created our own. And that's what you have in that area. What we began to see with the 60s and urban renewal was a total disinvestment as well as the removal of almost 11,000 individuals right within that area. Um, it's always a misunderstanding. I think people think of a renewal and they know the impact that occurred downtown, but they don't really speak on what was happening within Northeast Oklahoma City to individuals, to homes in that area. And then the continued disinvestment, that area continues to be open and blighted. Um, 70s and 80s, eminent domain, and then ultimately the construction of Interstate 235. <clears throat> in the 90s, Oklahoma City and the launching of MAPS was a commitment to communities, to areas of this city to educate, to rejuvenate, um, and the Renaissance. And that's what we see as the possibility here with the Foster Center. The 2000s, the Renaissance, 2010, the Fourth Street TIF, which will be of benefit to the Foster Center. And then, of course, the emergence of the Innovation District. As we move to the future, we know that Innovation Hall is already under construction. We see the construction of the Foster Center in 23, the updates to Washington Park, which would be to the east of the Foster Center in 24, and then ultimately the 10th Street Bridge expansion in 27. So with that history in mind, standing on the shoulders of our ancestors and acknowledging the emerging innovations that are coming about with the uh, Innovations District, we recognize that this is a prime opportunity for the city of Oklahoma City to begin to invest more in, uh, intentionally in its surrounding communities. This is a quote from the Ernst & Young study of uh, the spring, summer of 2021. And their research recognized that the same, that this is an opportunity to boost and expand um, opportunity as well as uh, economic development for those surrounding communities using the tools that are available to us currently. We um, also know that we can pair um, the, the emerging opportunities of the Innovations District together with research and together with a, the with a community-focused, community-centered initiative to bring some degree of parity to our small businesses. As we look at the uh, population, as uh, Dr. Quentin and uh, Kimberly mentioned, we, know, we dramatically, it's dramatic, the, lack, uh, the disparity and the lack of opportunity that is apparent for our um, BIPOC communities. Um, our our, our uh, Hispanic or Latinx communities represent only 5% of the business ownership population. Their representation within the community in the city of Oklahoma City is 21%. Likewise, for our African American and black uh, business owners, those percentages of ownership is 2%. That percentage is 2%, while the population is 13 to 14% of our uh, Oklahoma City population. Our Asian and Native American populations have, it, have achieved parity, but we do know that there are yet barriers and, and la a lack of opportunity for those businesses to grow and scale, uh, scale and, and thrive in our current uh, state. 
So with that acknowledgement, as we continue to uh, dive into the research, we wanted to know where exactly these businesses are. And they are located throughout the Oklahoma City area. These are some of the zip codes where uh, a portion of our BIPOC businesses uh, are currently. Um, you can see the range there. Those zip codes represent central Oklahoma City, uh, northeast Oklahoma City, northwest, southeast, southwest. And those, um, those, uh, that distribution is clearly throughout Oklahoma City, which would indicate that the economic impact is throughout Oklahoma City. Um, going forward, we also um, studied the um, gaps where there were or were not opportunities for our businesses to grow and thrive. As we worked with these businesses over the past several years, we have acknowledged, we recognize that there are substantial gaps in knowledge, gaps in access. Some of those include in, with respect to business education and skill sets, have the, having the ability to acknowledge, recognize, and develop the strategies and services that are necessary to operate businesses at sustainable levels. These businesses also lack capital. Um, we are also recognizing that there is a limited social mobility uh, for our BIPOC-owned businesses, that there are communication issues as well as a cultural disconnect and a lack of the ability to cultivate uh, innovation within these, these business populations. What we have done is to, in reviewing those, uh, those businesses and what their greatest needs have been, we have designed uh, programming and interventions to address those needs through workshops and training, through technical assistance, through tiered funding resources from $1,000 to $2 million through, through the tools that we have available to us through this consortium, um, as well as through public entities, our, fed, our, our financial, our local financial institutions. Um, we are creating strategic connections through our organizations, as well as through um, the, the um, representation that uh, we, we support, that we, that we are standing here uh, on behalf of. Um, we'll provide English language learners with opportunities in their native languages. Um, the center will be BIPOC focused, and we will also um, have the consultation and acceleration opportunities for these businesses. Yes, so here are a couple of profiles of the different entrepreneurs that we will be serving. Um, as you can see, it's very diverse. Um, we hope to serve nonprofit seeking consulting uh, strategies that are centered around BIPOC communities. We see uh, businesses that are in the manufacturing industry who need help and support with internal systems and also loans to buy equipment. We see also uh, potential investors who are seeking their next venture and as well as other community members that have brick and mortar stores and businesses that sustain um, BIPOC communities here in Oklahoma City. So we will reach um, our entrepreneurs and our clients through street teams. Uh, street teams would be individuals um, that go door to door uh, to businesses that attend events um, that create these connections and relationships with the business owners in order to uh, bring the services to them. We would also use traditional media um, to uh, expand um, our mission and then social media as well. And so when you enter the center, you will be greeted, of course. You will take an intake assessment. Um, from there, you will be assigned an, a business advisory team. That business advisory team will then help develop a strategy um, that uses our resources, so our workshops, our uh, trainings, our accelerators. And then from there, that same business, uh, develop, that same business advisory team will help you implement your strategy um, through technical assistance, coaching, uh, mentoring, and also, uh, of course, follow the development of uh, your business. Uh, once uh, the business is ready, we will then uh, move them on to the next resource, which is uh, access to capital, which <coughs> is tiered. We have microloans, we have SBA loans, and we also have partnerships with traditional bank bankers. And we hope to also uh, offer micro retail and other connections to uh, future potential partners. Um, so in addition, at the end, once the business goes through our steps, we are still going to be connected with them. Uh, they will be our client, they will be our friend through the rest of their uh, business venture. And so we hope to also support them through additional resources that might be upcoming, either if it's uh, 
let's say, VC, venture capital, or other resources that we can offer to them, um, they're going to be part of our, uh, our community and our network. This consortium is really a true collaboration where uh, each of the members brings something unique and different, but the whole will be more than the sum of our individual parts. Uh, I represent the Small Business Development Center. Oklahoma's SBDC has been in existence in our state for almost 40 years now, and we represent uh, uh, an important component of the economic development infrastructure within the state. Some of what we bring to the table here is a, a long track record of technical assistance that's provided free of charge to the community. It mostly falls into two different primary categories. One is uh, trainings, which is done in group settings. Um, we have a full array of trainings that are offered on a regular basis, but we can also do customized trainings for communities or groups. And then the other um, major category is one-on-one -on -one personalized consulting, also done completely free of charge, completely confidentially, and it, it meets the specific needs of a small business owner or an entrepreneur who's looking to start a small business. So one, um, you know, concern that, that some have or that, uh, you know, we may just be operating a building and bringing kind of the same old thing into the space to offer to, uh, to the community. But actually, what we think one, one main um, benefit of our consortium um, as collaborators is to also be able to create um, new and responsive um, experiences and programs that really respond to the need um, in real time. And so uh, there's a quote that, another great quote from the Ernst, Ernst & Young study um, that, that emerged that we feel like is really, uh, that was in response to their, um, to the MAPS for allocation uh, for the Henrietta B. Foster Center that we really feel like uh, our project is a response to. Um, OKC would be well served if this funding of brick and mortar project is combined with broader efforts to expand and strengthen the capital access toolbox for entrepreneurs of color, high growth technology companies, and small business in general. Um, we intend to accomplish all of that um, and more. <laughs> As I mentioned before, we, in, we intend to be transformative and um, some of those new uh, service offer offerings that fall under the uh, technical as assistance um, kind of bucket uh, would be to offer uh, business and market analytics, uh, certification programming. Uh, we're working now to stand up a supplier diversity programming. Um, uh, capacity and sustainability planning, not only for our small business enterprises, but also for our <laughs> nonprofits, which were mentioned earlier. Um, a, a, a real commitment to our English language learning uh, population of business owners, um, really allowing them to better access the same types of services um, and knowledge base that uh, that that folks that. Uh, where English is a first language can access, and then also to connect to workforce development efforts. Um, there's also a component of social innovation that uh, really connects to, that really hopes to connect to some of the community development work that is already occurring, uh, not only within the Northeast Oklahoma City community, but also communities of color uh, throughout the city, and to lean into those and be a home base for a lot of organizing around those. We, we intend to offer uh, micro retail, um, opportunities within the space um, and a real chance for collaboration. And then lastly, what uh, some of what Daisy alluded to uh, with Enterprise Accelerator, really being able to offer um, those different forms of access to capital from uh, traditional banking, which we know is more risk averse, um, all the way up to venture capital, which is not necessarily uh, where a lot of uh, minority entrepreneurs have traditionally had um, knowledge of or access to that really focuses on uh, founder, uh, the founder, the concept, and um, their ability to execute more so than the balance sheet. So really the, the power of, of what we're bringing before you is the power of partnership, not only represented in the consortium that stands in front of you and the individual expertise in the, in the small business community that we each have, but also the network that each of the organizations brings to a broader partnership um, to serve the community. Here on the slide, just 
um, highlights many of the partners that have uh, um, committed uh, to support of this project um, in support of this consortium um, working in this space. Um, we've, we are already have commitments from uh, lenders um, to um, have, have tiered um, conditions or, or um, tiered, tiered models um, to where they, uh, if, if an individual is, uh, an entrepreneur is seeking services in the Foster Center that they um, maybe uh, would be willing to take more risk or um, be willing to uh, maybe um, uh, give access to capital that maybe currently weren't there if they were a member and going through the accelerator program. And so um, we have one lender that's, that's committed um, a minimum of a million dollars a year um, to the BIPOC community and uh, in, in capital access. And then um, as we spoke earlier with the micro loans, and so we have a diversity of, um, of partnership that way. But that's really uh, that collaborative environment and creating a center that is a catalyst for collaboration in the community and, and collaboration with small business owners and uh, from those with an idea to those um, that are further down the road in, in small business uh, development that just need that extra hand up uh, uh, of support to be successful. Um, just start where we're at in our process in, in terms of uh, this consortium and, and our planning for the facility as well as uh, this overlaid with the construction and uh, design timeline here with, with the Henry B. Foster Center. So as you can see, we've, uh, we're, we're wrapped up the part of, of, of responding to the RFQ and now into the uh, road mapping phase upon um, um, approval, full approval uh, of this is when we'll move into the, the official road mapping phase of strategic planning as well as community engagement. And as was mentioned earlier with our marketing strategies is very similar um, to our strategic planning process to have street teams and um, uh, to go out into the communities that, um, that are affected, but also in, in those that the Henrietta B. Foster Center holds a dear place um, in the community and in their hearts. Um, it, it is a key part of the community, and we want this to be the next iteration of the legacy of Henrietta B. Foster, um, that this is, a, this is a new iteration of the social change and the innovation that Ms. Foster stood for, and, um, and so we're so excited to be able um, to do that. We're excited to uh, continue to engage the community, and so this center uh, truly serves um, the community. We mentioned here some of the uh, key performance indicators as listed here on the screen, uh, some of the things that we're going to be um, tracking, not only uh, amounts of training and effectiveness in that, but growth of, of businesses that are seeking services um, at the center, um, and at the end of the day, that economic impact that um, those businesses are making uh, back into the Oklahoma City community. And so we, we talked about, you know, a real strength in um, being able to collaborate. And we really, we really think that this slide really provides uh, an excellent background for context to, um, and how we intend to really leverage that. So what we're looking at is obviously an image of um, the innovation, well, the area where the innovation district boundaries are, you're seeing a couple sets of boundaries um, where the, uh, the red is the, uh, represents the uh, outline, the southern outline of the innovation district. And then within that, uh, oh, and I should say the innovation district, we've talked about a couple of times today, but there's obviously a lot of public investment, um, a lot of investment for uh, the city that where we really want to see um, those those uh, connections between industries there um, uh, turn into outcomes of success that really generate uh, an economic driver for the state. And so we feel like the, uh, the Henrietta B. Foster Center really represents an opportunity to connect uh, minority entrepreneurs and enterprises to that ecosystem uh, really on a, on a ground floor. And if you, you see in the, the thick blue uh, bound area. That's where the Henrietta B. Foster Center is located, uh, which is right at the, the corner, near the corner of 4th and Lincoln. Um, and then in that, the, the portion outline in black, that's, that's really a historic neighborhood um, that has recently had um, an opportunity to, to cast, to vision cast about what the future of it will be uh, through the south of 8th 
process. And so it's really, uh, the Henrietta, Henrietta B. Foster Center is really in a position to be connected to it all. And that's why we talk about the opportunity for, transfer, uh, for transformation, but also to be a model because of these embedded opportunities. And so to bring things to a close, um, really what we feel like our key, uh, our key strengths are, uh, we've hit on multiple times, is uh, that ability to collaborate and really be connected to um, other players that are looking to be involved um, in order to create those pipelines for uh, minority enterprises and entrepreneurs. Um, we also have strong partnership um, from an organization in Metro Tech that has operated uh, facilities um, throughout the city um, and um, has a great fiscal responsibility and a track record with that. Um, and then just our commitment to be able to really link the, sh the strengths of this particular community's past and um, its ability to economically sustain uh, from within um, to a vision of the future that can do some of the same. Um, and also connect that to other communities of color uh, throughout the city. And so this picture is actually a representation of that connection to the past. Um, uh, I always like to set it up and then throw it off to Melva, but uh, you know, this image represents a, a, a grand opening, like a ribbon cutting, I believe, a facility, and we'll hand off to Melva for the rest. <laughs> In closing, um, as uh, Dr. Quentin, Dr. Hughes has already uh, expressed for us, we stand on the shoulders of some extraordinary leaders in the black community, Mrs. Foster being one, Mrs. Clara Lupa being one, and we're graced with the honor of Brother Benton and here today. And you know, when we think back on their sacrifices and the energies and the time that they can invest it in the Northeast Oklahoma City community and in the city of Oklahoma City, um, and these, these were people who were recognized and acknowledged nationwide. We know that we have a commitment. We have a, we have a strong legacy, and we've got to honor that legacy. We've been um, really blessed with the opportunity to be exposed to a great number of new, innovative, and creative means and methods for growing and sustaining businesses, for growing and sustaining communities. We've all been brought together, I think, by design, um, if you will, I'll get a little churchy of the higher power, uh, <laughs> to start to um, implement, to, to ignite a new energy for our Northeast community. This um, Foster Center represents that opportunity. It represents that ignition. And we are very confident that we have the skill sets, we have the abilities, the atmosphere is ripe, the time is now. We've already started to begin to develop these programs. We'll be implementing pilots of these programs coming September and before the end of this year. And we know that our partners, our partnership is strong, it's alive, it's energized, multi-generational, multi-ethnic, broad, deep range of skills. We're ready to go and do this thing. So thank you for your time. Um, we look forward to hearing more from you and engaging with you as our, well as our community. Thanks. Thank you all, love that presentation. So um, I would, Allie, do you have anything from our presentation yesterday? Yeah, I mean, I think the same as yesterday, it was really comprehensive today. We had a really um, good and robust uh, series of questions uh, yesterday, but I think you all really kind of incorporated that into your presentation today. Um, I'm like just really impressed with how early in the process you're bringing all of the right people to the table and you've been like really thoughtful and intentional about that from the beginning. Um, we're really excited about this project and glad to hear this presentation again. Thank you. Any other questions, Bob? Well, not a question. I just want to thank you for the, uh, your presentation. Uh, I have to confess, I, I didn't have much of an image of what the Foster Center would be doing moving forward beyond the brick and mortar that we've you know talked about up to this point and, and thank you this is exciting I'm fired up <laughs> it, 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 it is so needed obviously in in this city and it's exciting to see this kind of consortium uh, come together and utilize what we can do as maps for to, to build the building uh, turn it over to an operator and then say go get it uh, it's, uh, it's exciting to hear from you, and thank you for, for being here to tell us about it. 
Thank you. Anyone else? It, yes, Harry. I would like to make a comment as well. Sure, absolutely. Uh, well, it doesn't matter. Everybody can hear me. Anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, I just noticed on the on one of the, the diagram of all the sponsors, Kiva. I, I participate in microloans internationally through Kiva. I had no idea that I could participate in, in this, the development through this. I'm so excited about that, and I would encourage any of you that, that you might be interested in, I'm not, I'm not wealthy, and I can't do a lot, but, but $100, $250 or something, and you get to choose the people you want to, that loan to go toward, I would encourage you to investigate that and to, and to be a part of this. I, Yes, Daisy, I can see you want to talk to that. Yep. I'm the one who manages uh, Kiva here in Oklahoma City. There's two uh, borrows right now, two businesses crowdfunding. So if you go to progressokc.org slash borrow, um, you can click down there and it shows everyone in Oklahoma City who has used a Kiva loan. Um, so I do encourage you to go. There's three more coming and um, stay up to date with Progress OKC and you'll see more. Thank you, Harry. Thank appreciate you. that. Call, calling that to our attention. Yes. I do want to say this is a fabulous presentation, and I know that the constituents in Ward 7 are very, very, very eager for this to get started. And so I am so glad that um, we're going to use an existing building, we're going to bring it back to life in some sort of way, however that looks. Um, but just to know that it'll still be there and it's coming back is, is, is heartfelt. Uh, does anybody else have something? So I, mine, might, mine might take just a couple moments. So, okay. Uh, so impressed, beyond impressed. It was more than I ever even hoped for when we crafted the maps for package. It, you all, I couldn't have dreamed that this is what it would be. Um, I'm especially thankful Representative Shelton had invited me on a tour of Metro Tech last fall, and Kaya Fletcher wanted to see me. They're in charge of the culinary arts uh, program at Metro Tech. And uh, as I'm doing that tour and I see Kaya, what I did not anticipate was to see a young man named Enrique. And there he was, tamales and salsa. Who is Enrique, you might be asking yourself. He's one of my former AVID college preparation students at Jefferson Middle School. AVID is about achievement via individual determination. And we emphasized that individual part. And we focused on strengthening their reading, writing, critical thinking, group work, and organization skills. And we always asked them, what's your purpose? What's your passion? What problem do you want to solve? And I can tell you right now, I'm going on about this because I promise you that's missing in a lot of classrooms and a lot of school districts. We don't ask our kids at age five onward, what's your purpose? What's your passion? What problems do you want to work on? And I think if we did that year after year, up to when they can become concurrent enrollment students like Enrique, we would see such a sea change in this city. A sea change. And I'm going to warn everybody, if I can be a bit of a gospel moment as well, until we do that, we will continue to see these high incarceration rates. We are number one in the country. Until we ask our students every day, what's your passion, what's your purpose, what problems do you want to solve? And talking about undoing a legacy, unfortunately, go on to the comments on KOCO, K4, News OK. Too often, what you'll see is a counter to what I just said. The legacy you all put in that presentation, there are still people in our city, unfortunately, who will say, well, the real reason why black and brown people don't achieve is because of it. And then you name the stereotype. You name the stereotype from the legacy of white supremacy. You name it, there it will be in those comments. But Enrique, Enrique tells a different story. My student Evelyn, who is from Jefferson, who one day when I was adjuncting, refilling this water bottle there at UCO, I heard Mr. Cooper. No one calls me Mr. Cooper at the college level. They call me James. And I turn around and there's Evelyn, who also is a former Jefferson student, now enrolled at UCO. So whether it's Metro Tech, a regional university, a college, you name it, we have the skills right here and we have the resources. The AVID College Preparation Program, if you're listening to this, get your students in it. OKCPS okay, has it. 
But it's missing, you'll have to, oh God, I hope you're hearing me on that. I just hope you are. I have a question though, and it's pretty profound. I just so happened to have yesterday come across the UCLA School of Law Williams Institute, and they did a study that was LGBT poverty in the United States. And I just wanna share that, and then I need your help. Or rather, I'd ask for your help. Um, here's what we learned from the study, which is really one of the first to ever happen. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people collectively have a poverty rate of 21.6%. This rate of 21.6% is much higher than the rate for cisgender straight people. Cisgender straight people have a poverty rate of 15.7%. Uh, let those numbers hang out. I just learned them, so I'm gonna have to internalize them myself. So straight people, 15.7%. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender folk, 21.6%. It's much higher, says this study. Moreover, among lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people, transgender people have especially high rates of poverty, 29.4%. I had the same reaction Bob's face just did. Yeah, that was me too. Um, lesbian and straight cisgender women have higher poverty rates than gay and straight cisgender men. When you dig into those numbers, as I have done, because some of you might be going, well, we just heard a whole conversation about skin color and the legacy of white supremacy. You did, which is why I'd like to say this as well from the study. Black, white, Asian, and other lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people have statistically, excuse me, significant higher poverty rates than their same sex. I'm sorry, then, I'm sorry, let me back up. So I'll make sure you hear this right, I'm so sorry. Black, white, Asian, and other race, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people have statistically significant higher poverty rates than their same race cisgender straight counterparts. For example, 30.8% of black, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people live in poverty. One more time. 30.8% of black, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people live in poverty, whereas 25.3% of black cisgender straight people live in poverty. Lesbian, gay, bisexual people in rural areas have the highest poverty rates compared to lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people in urban areas. I wanna connect some dots for everybody. And it's something I have not spoken about publicly the way I'm about to right now, but it's, it keeps me up at night. When I made history as the city's first elected openly LGBT person, I also, as you all recall, made history as the first biracial black person elected outside of the honorable Nikki Nice's ward, where when your presentation began, we know that that history of segregation on the east side is why a historically black population exists on the east side. So the dot I'd like to connect for everybody right now is that sometimes people, when they think of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people, the stereotype holds that they are just white people. That's literally something I've heard said to me before I've heard that, and that's also been, when I hear it, it's always in the worst ways, because when I hear it, I hear it as, sometimes within the black pe community, people will say, we don't have gay people. I hear it in Middle Eastern communities, we don't have gay people. That's a white people thing. That's madness to hear that. That is madness. The next thing I would wanna say, though, is we also, there are so many black, Hispanic, Latinx, Native American, Asian, 
lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people in our city right now who have a purpose that no one has ever asked them about, who have a passion that no one has ever asked them about, and what has kept them from coming out of the closets too often is that it used to be illegal until 2003 in this state to be openly LGBT until the Supreme Court overturned that. So they stay closeted at their employment because they're afraid they'll lose their employment. So they stay at a job that they don't like and they're afraid to lose that job. So they're closeted and too often they don't even take on partners because they're so afraid. That's the history. When I, went, when I go to Kindred Spirits on the east side and I have a cocktail on that patio, I feel so welcome. I want to see more. I want to see more LGBT people of color owning businesses along Southwest 29th Street, in the Paseo, in Uptown, in Britain, in Windsor District, in Capitol Hill. This isn't right. It's gone on for so long. I'm tired of people saying that when we mention race, we're divisive. No, we're acknowledging difference. And we're acknowledging history. What can we do? What can I do? I did not see a single mention of those letters. And I don't think it's out of malice. I know, oh my God, I know all of your heart. No, I don't know some of you, but I know, I know Representative Shelton. I know Dr. Hughes. I know Daisy. I know your heart. You didn't do that out of malice. I know that. I know that. But God help me. Help me connect my people. Help me. Is it Freedom Oklahoma? Is it ACLU? Who is our partner here? Is it 39th Street? Why is there, why are these businesses not here right now? And what can we do to connect them to Kiva? Because if we don't connect them, these poverty statistics are their destiny. And I want their destiny to be Enrique and Evelyn. Thank you for your comments, uh, Councilman Cooper. I would like to just in response um, and in support of your passionate words, the LGBTQ community is definitely a part of our uh, surrounding and, and the community in which we intend to engage. Um, very often, I, I do a lot of research, look at a lot of data. It's very often very difficult to retrieve that data accurately uh, to, because for the very reasons that you just outlined, um, identifying people uh, who would, we could realistically publish uh, but we do know that the population exists and exists in large number. And we, we intend to be inclusive. We intend to be inclusive. Everybody will be welcomed um, through the services of the uh, Foster Center. Um, our design is to um, incorporate culturally relevant uh, approaches to our work at the Foster Center, and that's how it will, that's how it will go forward. So, Thank you. We'll certainly want to have more contact with those organizations that you have representation with um, in, in engaging them and connecting them to the Foster Center. It's an honor. Yeah, uh, thank you, Councilman, for your, for your comments. They're profound and powerful. Um, I did want to address a little bit on the first part of your comments just to tell you where our space is and engaging and continuing to engage high school age students and, and young adults in this process, um, not only um, as, as you got to see on our campus, um, a, a thriving entrepreneurship program of, of high school students. Um, what we are um, in, in discussions now looking at models of how do we engage young people, young entrepreneurs into this environment at the Henrietta B. Foster Center to bring them into this um, collaborative and innovative environment for them uh, that there is no age restriction on uh, small business and there is no um, box sort of put around them as far as um, what they can dream and what they can do and to be a catalyst in the community for our young people um, to seek those services and to be able to um, to be uh, guided through the process and um, we've, we've looked at um, um, summer camps um, or, or 
uh, quick experiences. Uh, one that I had a, a privilege of being a part of when I, when I lived in Omaha, Nebraska, um, was facilitated by the Gallup organization. And to be able to identify young entrepreneurs at a very young age and be able to put them through an intentional set of development, leadership development and personal development and business acumen development. Um, and they actually started a business uh, as part of that process. Um, it's called Builders Program, if you've, if you've heard of it or seen it. Um, they use a, an entrepreneurial profile to be able to identify those that have spikes of entrepreneurial excellence um, in, in the way that um, they see problems, the way they problem solve and all those things, and then to be able to put them through an intentional process to be able to uh, grow that skill set and don't leave it hibernating um, as they go through maybe a traditional education path that this could be an additional education path for our young people, so. Thank you. Any other comments? I just wanna say that consortiums and group leadership is tough, um, but as I mentioned yesterday, watching how you all have evolved and your connection, you're not, like I said yesterday, you're not quite finishing each other's sentences, but the, the collaboration is so strong that um, I echo what Bob said. It's, this is an exciting project and we appreciate y'all leading it. Okay, so I believe we have um, a citizen who has signed up to speak, Mr. Washington. Again. Oh, calling up on me, huh? oh, well. I think, number one, This was a profound presentation. Here, you know how to know the presentation. I like the way I put that. Now, I think. But once again, I failed to hear my name on my organization called. I'm not saying it's discriminatory, but I can say I was never contacted regarding the building or refurbishment of this innovation project, because that's what it is. The only way I really see it be successful, again, the jury's out right now, is that I'm at least given some kind of office space inside the building. I'd love to say that I was a part of it. Now, I hope it's not going to be held against me because I don't have money, like the recognized people up here that we just saw on the board. That's my only concern. Because I haven't seen anybody that doesn't have any money spoken about on this, just as much as men just talked about the LGBT community here. That's what my concern is. Uh oh, now watch this one. I think that success can come from all of this. Let me be the first to admit this. Self preservation is the first law of nature that we're dealing with here. Taking it back positions that was literally even recently, when I say recently, I'm talking about over a couple of years, where you move the black community out of the community so that these opportunities can come up to fruition. Not necessarily get this one now, don't get me wrong. Urban renewal was perfectly plain in his intent to move us out. All these places that you see on 4th Street and all this here used to be alleyways where I used to run in my teenage and informative years. Run through the alleys and, and run up trees and things of this nature. But the only way we can pull this innovation district off and others that they're talking about is that you have to move black folks out and reestablish a white-oriented community, basically coming into what is coming because gentrification is strong. Let's not pretend with each other, okay? Now then, I am saying again. 30 seconds. That I need to be included into these processes. Now, I'm not an entrepreneur, y'all. By the way, matter of fact, I got a 1989 car that I drive. So, you know what I mean? The money is not in, in my forte here. But the fairness, the operation, and the inclusion of everyone, whether you have money or not, you can't discriminate against me because you're using state and taxpayers' dollars that says everybody must be given access, not again, not these people now, to everything that goes on. Time. Time's up. Bang. Bobby Buck. Michael, yes. before you come back once more, um, did you know right now on the city of OKC's Instagram and Facebook page, there is a survey. This is for everyone else following at home too. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a survey right now 
about the innovation district where people can do precisely what you're asking for. They can add their opinions. Would you mind taking uh, into your consideration sharing that? And same with the good people at home. Get their opinions added to this. And I bet our good friends who are here right now would also love to hear from you outside as well after this meeting. So share it, share it with your people. Thank you. I will do that because I love money now. All of a sudden, no, let me get this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so if we have no further comments, um, we'll take a motion and a second. Please cast your votes. The motion passes, thank you very much. Okay, moving on to item 3G, recommend approval of binding term sheet for the lease and management agreement between the City of Oklahoma City, the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority, and the Freedom Center OKC um, for MAPS 4 Clara Looper Civil Rights Center Operating Partner. Okay. So this is an affirmation that Freedom Center LLC of OKC LLC will be the operators of the Clara Looper Center. Christina Beatty is here to give a very brief presentation of what they are doing. <laughs> Good morning, Christina. Good to have you here. Good morning, everyone. Yes, I will keep it brief. My name is Christina Beatty. I'm project director for the Freedom Center of Oklahoma City. And so we just wanted to give you a quick update on where things are uh, in terms of our work towards becoming the operator. So as we have mentioned and come before this body before, we are moving forward with the restoration of the historic property. Uh, and so these are just some images from the past month or so. We have uh, moved forward with removing the granite monument that stood outside. It's being restored by a company called Wilbert Memorials and it will be stored away for protection so that it is not damaged during the construction process. Uh, we are having to do some asbestos remediation to the building itself, and so otherwise the focus is on the exterior of the property in terms of uh, breaking up all the concrete exterior demolition, removing trees, the additional uh, wall memorials that were on the north side of the property, and um, they've also dug trenches for the stem wall, and we're just doing as much as we can outside while we get the inside of the building safe for construction. And so as a reminder, this is the image uh, of the design for the building uh, once it is restored. We are working with Atelier Corey Henry uh, in partnership with Balkus Payne Architecture. And as you can see, the goal here is really to restore the building to the period of significance uh, where it was wrapped in brick on three sides and the pitch roof added. That was a decision made by Mrs. Looper and Freedom Center back in the 90s, and so that is the period of significance that we're restoring it to. Um, we are having a little bit more flexibility and really looking at how we can work with the land around the building itself to make it as useful as possible for programming. So we'll have the hardscape in the front, we'll have a dedicated space bringing the monument back on the corner, a small lawn on the side, a larger lawn in the back. There have been some slight modifications to provide additional parking. Um, but overall, this is kind of the, the overall idea. And so briefly, just to kind of give you an idea of how we have spent the summer, uh, we have been, and many of you know, but we have been working with Lord Cultural Resources for the past year to develop a formal business plan. And so Joy Bailey Bryant, who is the US president of that company, came and did presentations uh, back in early May. We spent the rest of May kind of assimilating uh, input and, and finalizing that business plan. In June, we responded to the city's request for operations information, utilizing the information from that business plan as well as from all of our planning and conversations with partners. Uh, and last month, we signed the binding term sheet, which we hope to get approved today. And so moving forward, the big questions that everyone has had for us are what are we going to do and how are we going to do it? And so at a really high level, the what, 
Uh, we're looking at exhibitions, we're looking at collections, and we're looking at programming. Programming will be the heart of what we do at Claire Looper Civil Rights Center. Um, however, we will have both temporary and semi-permanent exhibitions that help tell the story. Those will be prime opportunities for school group visits. We'll have, uh, we'll have curriculum and, and programming that help to interpret those, and, and that really becomes um, an educational resource that's also complemented by the collections. The collections are the items physically that came out of the Freedom Center building. Uh, I've done whole other presentations and I'm happy to talk to you guys about it at any time, but we've had really exciting time working with OU to develop the Freedom Center Community Archive. This building, the Freedom Center building was not purchased until 1967, but inside the building we've actually found NAACP membership records going back to the 30s and 40s. Uh, we have all kinds of wonderful uh, material, one of a kind, that you couldn't get anywhere else. And so this is going to be a huge part of us telling this authentic story of our local civil rights history here in Oklahoma City. And again, we're really excited for it to be an educational resource. We're working with OU. Um, we actually have a wonderful PhD student uh, working with us this summer. And you know, it's exactly the kind of archive that she would love to have access to for her research. Uh, and so we're really excited about what that's going to do to complement our offerings. Um, but again, programming will truly be the heart of what happens. Uh, we are looking at three core themes. It's kind of the way that we have organized this. Youth development and mentorship will always be at the center. Claire Looper was first and foremost an educator. And so youth, uh, youth development and mentorship will continue to be at the center of what we do moving forward. However, we also want to think about lifelong learning and engagement, as well as cultivating community and belonging. And so there will be, as I mentioned, programming to complement exhibitions, such as guided tours, school group visits, curriculum tools, and teacher trainings. Uh, after school and summer programming for youth will build on that legacy of Freedom Center activities. And then there will be adult-focused programs, such as community forums, performances, book clubs, workshops, an annual national speaker series. Um, all of these are ideas as we continue to grow and hire on program staff, we'll get into more specificity, but we're really excited about all of the possibilities there in terms of programming. So to shift from the what to the how, uh, we need resources, right? And so we need revenue, we need staffing, and we need space. Uh, and so we are looking at revenue generation through admission by donation as well as school group charges. In order to make it as accessible as possible, we are not looking at charging for admission to see the exhibition. However, we certainly will accept donations and we are looking at school group visits can be free for teachers to tour through this space, but if you want um, staff facilitated activities and there would be an additional charge for that, that's the model we're looking at right now. Uh, there will be a combination of both free and charged public programs. We will have a retail space on site, which would generate some additional revenue. We see facility rental as a significant revenue line item. Uh, we will have membership programs and annual fundraising. Um, and really, the, the driver here is that we are planning to, in, to employ full-time development staff, uh, as well as create a private endowment in addition to the MAPS operation and maintenance endowment to give us a little bit of a leg up in terms of that uh, annual budget so that we're not starting from scratch every year. And so in terms of our staffing plans, we're looking at a dual director model to supervise a total of 21 FTEs. Uh, the executive director will oversee development, communications, exhibitions, and program staff, while director of finance and operations will oversee accounting, facilities, external rentals, retail, and visitor experience. Uh, we are really excited that we have just recently gotten additional support from Oklahoma City Community Foundation to move forward with the implementation planning. Uh, the business plan really gives us a good idea of where we want to be on opening day. The implementation plan will give us a roadmap of how to get there. And so that will help us uh, as we're making decisions about when we hire along the way. And so in terms of space needs, I'll just skip to the end here. We're really excited that the next phase is to move into um, design, pre-design and selecting the architecture and engineering firm and the design phase. I believe there's 18 months slated for that. And so again, through the business planning process, 
We are coming to the table with a really clear idea of how we would like to see space allocated. Um, you know, these are numbers that we created really to help us be able to build a budget, to think through how much space do we need to accommodate staff and all of those things. So this is kind of our wish list that we are excited to bring to the table as we step into the design process. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Christina, thank you. Appreciate that presentation. So questions, comments? I will say that the work of this group is phenomenal. Um, the attention to detail, um, the amount of the level of respect you have for the documents, for the, the space, the location, um, the input that you've gathered from the community have been all above and beyond um, what we or I thought of. So thank you for that. Thank you, Dr. Brunner. Anyone else? Okay, we do have a citizen that has signed up to speak on this topic. Um, Mr. Washington, three minutes. Hell no. That's right. How in the hell are these people won't even talk about the Freedom Center without mentioning my name? I am the one that we talk about Freedom Center today. You talk about ma'am, Miss Bruna, the so-called State of mind how people thought about the freedom center, really? It was me alone who went for nine months. And yet these people don't say no word about me. Man, this is an ongoing lawsuit right today that we got going on that y'all ain't know about. Now then. That's where I alone preserve the freedom center. You think I'm not asked them? Ask Mr. Uh, this guy here over here that I've been going to court with for the last five years. You understand me? Yeah, that wicked, fake, no good judge, now rest in peace, was the only reason that this no go, this so called group, is over this. How the hell y'all gonna have something they don't mention me in the process when they're by myself? Save that. The hell am I gonna be nice now? The hell you mean you're gonna leave something out without my damn permission? Really? Is something funny? God damn it, straighten it out, because I can so straighten you out, ma'am. I can visit you a lot more. You got damn right about that. Mr. Washington, now, please, please watch your language. Yeah, now then, play with me, straight up. Now, how in the world can you talk about preserving anything? Not even mentioning what, thank you, Michael Washington. I don't, if they'd have said that, I wouldn't have got up like this. I'd have said, hey, old man, y'all doing great. Hold it now. Or what did I tell you earlier? I don't hate anyone. I'm not going to disrespect anyone. But when you do me, look out as we see. I don't care what station in life, how many people you might know, where you've gone in your industries. As long as you respect me, I'm going to give you your high praise, but I demand mine back. That's right. What we going to do with the Freedom Center, we going to do exhibits, we going to do this here. That's right. Now, I might decide to disown a lot of things I own in my retrospect of what's going on if I'm given some kind of monument and recognition. I am the one who saw it within 10 years in 2010 when they closed the doors. Michael Washington was driving every day by himself. All of y'all, come on, leaders. Come on, black leaders. Come on, engineers. Now, y'all, let's do something here. They turned their head. 30 seconds. So I took on my own. I went to the Historic Preservation Commission. I've got the proof in my envelope. Katie Frittle can back all of this up, me by myself. You mean to tell me they're going to disregard me? How in the hell can I respect somebody like that? Come on now. If you have done something so great and good and collective, I'm going to be the first one to give you yours. But I'm not going to sit here and listen to this crap about what they're going to do and disregard me. Straight up, I'm going to tell the president and any doggone body else to get in my way. Time is up. Right, I'll be back. Matter of fact, we're going to do some more with this. What I heard, there ain't going to be no leasing nothing without my permission. Okay. Um, so if there's no other comments, We'll take a motion and a second. Please cast your vote. I vote yay. I'm signed out. Oh, okay. Okay, the motion passes. Thank you very much. 
Okay, moving on to item 3H, recommend negotiation of agreement with the Oklahoma City Housing Authority, MAPS 4, Homelessness Development Operating Partner. So this is just affirmation that we uh, will go with the uh, Housing Authority. This was an RFP process, they were the only respondent and we have reviewed what they've submitted and we think forthcoming we'll, we'll have an excellent agreement. Okay, any questions, Mr. Tart? Okay, seeing none, take a motion in a second. Please cast your votes. In a second, there we go. All right, motion passes, thank you very much. Okay, moving on to item 3I, recommend receipt of consultant committee memo Family, uh, sorry, MAPS for Family Justice Center and authorization to negotiate an architectural services contract with Alford Hall, Monaghan Morris, LLC. I'm very excited to get started on these projects. So this was the standard process for selecting architects and engineering and the committee that met recommends okay. AHMM is how we are referring okay. to Okay, AHMM, much easier. Yes. yes, thank you. Okay, any questions or comments? Okay, if not, I'll take a motion in a second. Please cast your vote. <coughs> motion passes, thank you. And our last action item is item 3J, recommend receipt of consultant committee memo MAPS for Diversion Hub and authorization to negotiate an architectural services contract with Reese Architecture. Same thing, this is um, for the Diversion Hub and uh, we recommend Reese. Okay, any questions? Okay, all righty, if none, I'll take a motion in a second. Please cast your vote. The motion passes, thank you. All right, moving on to item four. Um, any other discussion items? I have nothing else. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Great. Okay, moving on to item five, comments by the board, staff, or citizens. We do have a citizen that signed up. Mr. Washington, you have three minutes. Okay, thank you. Now that I seem to have got somewhat calm, cool and collected now, I extend my well profound without question mark apology to all of y'all. Thank you. Because number one, like I said, I'm def definitely teed off. Who wouldn't be? By myself, by myself, as Katie from the Historic Preservation, I brought it to attention and I by myself gave the presentation of it. That's very, very humble. No, don't worry about it. I'm not a, you know, real upset as I was. So don't, don't, don't think that. But my point of the matter, I'm not going to let anybody disown me. I am the reason that we're talking about it. I am the reason that it was passed on August 28th by the board of the uh, Oklahoma City Council on the 28th of 19, 20, 2019. Suddenly all the other people who have an interest in the state started coming out now. I'm saying to y'all, no. I'm told that Benton, Leonard has removed the Freedom Center from the Map 4 project. What are we here talking about it for then? I'm told that the man has raised, which I'll be getting ready to look at all his books. We're going to have fun after today, believe me. I'm told that he's raised more than $2 million for that project. Now all of a sudden, we're coming through maps? What's going on here? What's the plot here? What are we voting for here? The Clara Lucas Center, I understand. I know that some of us will be built downtown or whatever it's going to do. How's that tied in with the Freedom Center? Though? This is what my concern is. Okay, and where do we need permission from y'all to operate what belongs to us anyway? Again, I might be confused because it's the first time I heard all of it. So now, let me say this. It's not gonna work. Clara Lupa did not intend to give the Freedom Center to anyone and it's not gonna happen. Every time a black person stands up with some his historic significance of impression, of greatness, somebody always want to come on the outside and take 
credit for its building. It's not going to happen here. It's not going to happen here. We're going to be independent. We're going to be controlled by the city council, this board, or anybody else. The Freedom Center will be independent because that's exactly what Clara Luke intended to do. Now watch this one here. It wasn't just Clara Luke who got that Freedom Center together. It was through even me, days when I was growing up, when we gave donations, five, six, seven cents or whatever, cookouts, black beauty pageants and all. Huh? And ain't no one or two people done nothing. You know, it's been many of us that did. That's right. I was a part of all that when I was growing up. Not just because I did something today, uh, the other uh, two thousand seconds. So I'm saying to y'all, no. We want our hands off. It's a red flag. When anybody who thinks they're going to take the freedom center off and under me, my community, and people who love that, we'll march down on everybody before we allow that to happen. Straight up. I don't know. I think I got a track record when I speak like that. Thank y'all, Heaven. Thank y'all for this opportunity, and I will be back. Thank y'all so much. Thank you. Oh, if you've got any questions, please let me know. Area code 405 882 And my house address, excuse me, my business address is 217 North Harvey, Suite 5078. Yuppie. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Washington. Okay. Um, anything else from the staff? No, ma'am. Okay. Any comments from the board? I do. Okay. Um, for those watching at home, after what you just heard, I would just simply remind everybody that Clara Looper, the teacher, and Clara Looper's students marched peacefully and nonviolently. I know everyone up here knows that, but I think it's important to remember that. And I will also just say it was not about one person, it was about Clara and her students and the black folk who stood up collectively, collectively, and their white allies, and their allies across uh, black and brown skin. Just always remember that. And I personally would like to uh, apologize to our Ward 6 representative uh, for some of the comments I heard, uh, particularly because uh, you all are volunteers on this board. You're not doing this for money or legacy. You're doing this out of service and commitment to this city, and no one should have to sit through uh, threats of violence. And I believe that's a version of what we heard today. So. Um, I just want to say that uh, thank you for your service, and, and no one should have to hear that. And I, I would echo and say thank you all thank for you your so service much. very much. Appreciate it. Sorry. I just want to give one big shout out to my special guest who has I brought as a very eventful meeting today, um, and that's my daughter Lucy Brooks, 10 years old. This right. is what civic engagement looks like. <laughs> and this is what democracy looks like. <laughs> Uh, we appreciate you being here today. So, okay, appreciate all of you and um, enjoy, find some, find some cool air. Um, if there's no other business, we will be adjourned. Thank you. So everybody wondered when we were gonna start getting